Hello and welcome back to Children's Reading Cove. This is part two of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. That night, Juliet couldn't get to sleep. She could only think of Romeo. It was warm and the moonlight was shining on the trees in the orchard below. Juliet stepped out onto her balcony, but she was so troubled by what her nurse had told her that she hardly noticed how lovely the orchard looked. How can I be in love with someone I ought to hate? She sighed. Oh, Romeo, why do you have to be a Montague? If you had been born with any other name, I could tell you how much I love you. Romeo stepped out of the shadows of the trees into the moonlight. Call me your love, he said. It is the only name I want. Juliet looked down from her balcony and gasped. How did you get here? If anyone catches you, they will kill you. I climb the orchard wall, said Romeo. I had to see you again. I loved you the moment I first saw you, and I want to know if you feel the same. Juliet's face brightened with joy, then darkened into doubt. How can I be sure of your love? She said. How can I be sure that you will not forget me as soon as the night is over? Romeo looked up into Juliet's eyes and saw the way the moonlight shone in them. He knew he would never love anyone else. Meet me at Friar Lawrence's chapel at noon tomorrow, and we shall be married, Romeo declared. Married? laughed Juliet. But we have only just met. And what will our parents say? Do we need to meet more than once to know that our love is strong and real? said Romeo. Must we live apart because our family's hatred? A part of Juliet knew that for them to marry would be mad and impossible, but another part of her knew that if she sent Romeo away now, she might never see him again, and she wasn't sure she could bear that. Yes, she said. Yes, I believe what we feel for each other is true. And yes, I'll meet you tomorrow at the chapel at noon. So the next day, Romeo and Juliet were married. The bell in the clock tower of the cathedral tolled twice. The main square of Verona sweltered in the hot sunshine, and the air shimmered. Two young men were lounging beside a fountain, and the taller of the two, Romeo's closest friend, Mercutio dipped a handkerchief into the water and mopped his face. Where is he? he demanded irritably. He should have been here an hour ago. His companion, Romeo's cousin, Benvolio, smiled at Mercutio's impatience. Some important business must have detained him, he said. A pair of pretty eyes more alike, snorted Mercutio. But as he glanced across the square, he saw Romeo hurrying toward them. At last, Mercutio said sarcastically, I was beginning to think that the queen of the fairies had carried you off in your sleep. I have great news said Romeo. 
but you must promise to keep it a secret. Mercutio looked curiously at his friend. Oh, he said. I am in love, said Romeo. Benvolio laughed. Mercutio groaned and shook his head. You are always in love, he cried. A girl only has to look at you sideways to make you fall for her. It's more than that this time, said Romeo. I am in love with... Romeo, interrupted a harsh voice. Romeo turned and saw Tybalt with a group of sneering Capulets. Tybalt's right hand was resting on the hilt of his sword. You were at my family's house last night, he said. Now you must pay for your insolence. Draw your sword. Romeo's eyes flashed with anger, then grew calm. I will not fight you, Tybalt, he said. It would be like fighting one of my own family. Why, you milksop, jeered Tybalt. You're as cowardly as the rest of the Montagues. Romeo, gasped Mercutio, are you going to stand and do nothing while he insults your family? I must, said Romeo. You don't understand. I have no choice. But I do, snarled Mercutio. His rapier flashed in the sunlight as he drew it. If you want to fight, Tybald, I'm your man, he cried. In a movement too fast to follow, Tybalt brought out his sword and the two young men began to fight at a dazzling speed. Help me stop them, Benvolio, pleaded Romeo. He caught Mercutio from behind, pinning his arms to his sides. As he did so, Tybalt lunged forward and drove the point of his rapier through Mercutio's heart fatally wounding him. A plague on both your houses, he whispered with his dying breath. When Romeo realized that his friend was dead, rage surged through him and his hatred of the Capulets brought a bitter taste to his mouth. Tybalt! he cried, drawing his rapier. One of us must join Mercutio in death. Then let our words decide who it shall be, Tybalt snarled. Romeo hacked at Tybalt as though Tybalt were a tree that he wanted to cut down. At first, the watching Capulets laughed at Romeo's clumsiness, but as Tybalt began to fall back toward the center of the square, their laughter died. It was obvious that Tybalt was tiring and finding it difficult to defend himself. At last, Romeo and Tybalt stood face to face, their swords locked together. Tybalt's left hand fumbled at his belt, and he drew out a dagger. Romeo, seeing the dagger, clamped his left hand around Tybalt's wrist, and they stumbled and struggled with each other. Tybalt flicked out a foot, intending to trip Romeo, but instead he lost his own balance and the two enemies tumbled to the ground. Romeo fell on Tybalt's left hand, forcing the point of the dagger deep into Tybalt's chest. He felt Tybalt's dying breath warm against his cheek. A voice called out, Quick, the princess guards! And the Capulets scattered.
Benvolio helped Romeo to his feet. Come now before it is too late, he said, but Romeo did not hear him. He stared at Tybalt's body, and the full realization of what he had done fell on him like a weight. I have killed Juliet's cousin, he thought. She cannot love a murderer. She will never forgive me. How could I have let myself be such a fool? He was still staring at Tybalt when the prince's guards reached him. End of part two. Join me again soon for part three of Romeo and Juliet. Bye-bye.